Turn your Bibles, if you would. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And as you're turning there, a guy who works at a meat packing plant goes to work and sees three pieces of beef hanging from the ceiling. What's this all about? He asks his boss. His boss says, if you can jump up and slap the meat, you get a week's vacation free. But if you miss, you have to give up a week's vacation. You want to give it a go? The guy replies, no thanks. The stakes are just too high. This morning, I want to dig into God's word to see what it declares about the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to Christ's return. Amen? I look forward to it because the Bible esteems it. I look forward to it because the early church fathers esteemed it. I look forward to it because Satan hates it. Amen? And if he hates it, it's got to be good. That's all I know. But anyhow, I'm looking forward to the day when my very eyes will look upon the face of the dear Lamb of God. Amen. One thing is certain. We are all on a collision course with destiny, and none of us can afford to be ignorant of the truth. The sign of the times are all around us. There's no doubt about it. I don't know if any of you watched the opening ceremony of the Olympics, but it was absolutely horrific desecrating the scene of the Lord's Supper. This is where we've come as a world. We are living in Satan's world. It's his world system. And the signs are all around us. In fact, we're so close that I've actually stopped looking for the signs. I'm listening for the trumpet and the shout of the archangel. Amen. That's how close we are. And one of the most blessed truths in all of God's word is that Jesus can come at any time. Amen? Jesus can come at any time. In Revelation 22, verse 20, the very last prayer in the Bible says, Even so, Jesus, come. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. That's where we are. Amen? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's skip down to verse 8. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out, so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now, first and second Thessalonians, these two letters to the church at Thessalonica, they deal predominantly with the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the first thing I want us to see this morning is I want us to start with the wrath. And we're kind of going to take Um, these verses kind of work backwards. Look at the end of verse 10. It says, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Not only is Jesus coming, but the Bible tells us he's coming with wrath and judgment. But there's something more we need to take note of here in verse 10, is that there's something very specific about that phrase, the wrath to come. So what is the wrath to come? Well, you may have heard it by a different title. It's also referred to as the Great Tribulation Period. That's the same time frame that the Bible's talking about here. The Great Tribulation Period or the wrath to come. And the Tribulation Period, that is a seven-year stretch of literal hell on earth. If you think this world is in chaos today, The great tribulation, the wrath to come, 
Make these days look like a peaceful Sunday walk. Amen. Now, the tribulation will be a time of unspeakable suffering. In the book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1, Daniel says, It'll be a time of trouble such as was never before. Matthew, chapter 24, verse 21, listen to what Jesus said. He says, For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So what we need to understand is that this will be a very unique and horrific time of tribulation and suffering. Daniel, he called it a time of trouble. Jesus called it a time of great tribulation. And the Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Thessalonica, he called it the wrath to come. The time of trouble, time of great tribulation, the wrath to come. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6 for a moment. Skip down to verse 15. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? You know, we always hear about the love of Christ. And yes, Jesus is love. Amen. The Bible declares that God is love. But it also declares that he is the great judge of all creation. And those that reject his love offering of redemption, the love offering that he made on Calvary's cross, will have to face the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath to come. Now, all of these passages, whether it was Daniel, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, or, or Jesus himself, they're all saying the same thing. There is coming a day, a time like never before. There's coming a time that's never been paralleled, and the Bible calls it the wrath to come. Let's stay in Revelation 6. Let's go up to verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, one of the angels, saying with a loud voice like thunder, Come and see. A loud voice like thunder. What, do you, what, what, what comes to mind when you hear thunder? What's coming? A storm's approaching, amen? And the storm of God's judgment is on the horizon. In the next few verses here in chapter 6, God is going to describe four horsemen to us. These horsemen will ride onto the world scene right at the beginning of the great tribulation period. They are also known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse, and they are synonymous with the wrath to come. Now, let's read a little bit further in God's word and find out a little bit more about these horses. Let's look at verse 2. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now, at first glance, many make the mistake and falsely believe that this is Christ on that white horse. But if we read closer and we pay attention to these verses... It lets us know that the rider is actually the Antichrist trying to appear as the Savior. Amen? He has a bow, and that bow represents war, bloodshed, and he goes out, the Bible says, conquering and to conquer. Antichrist will rule the world during the tribulation period. His crown, it describes that he's wearing a crown. That is symbolic of the dominion that he was given by Satan who is the prince of this world. Now, I get asked a lot. I say, Pastor, do you really believe that Antichrist will actually rule the world? Yes, I believe it 100% because the Bible guarantees it. Amen? John chapter 5, verse 43. 
Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. But yet another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Amen? Jesus is telling us here that the world rejected him, but they will receive. They're going to embrace the Antichrist during the time of the tribulation. And he's going to come riding in on his white horse to deceive the entire world. Amen? They're going to believe it's Christ. They're going to believe it's Messiah. They're going to believe this is the one they've been waiting for to, to unite the world. But it's going to be Antichrist. You see, this world is rejecting God left and right. Even in this Christian nation, we have kicked God out. And God is going to step back and he's going to say, you know what? I'm going to give you what you want, but you're not going to like what you get. And that's Antichrist. Let's look at verse 3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature, the angel, saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. So this second horse that we see, this red horse of war and bloodshed, as the Antichrist goes out to conquer, he's quickly followed by the red horse, and the Bible says his purpose is to take peace from the earth. Now we look around the world today in every single nation, is heavily armed and ready to fight, aren't they? Every major nation of the world is armed to the gills. Sadly enough, we know more about war than we do about peace. We live in a world of military giants and moral infants. And all of this is going to come to a climax. And the Bible calls it, the great day of the wrath to come. Now again, the Holy Spirit and the church will be removed at the rapture, right? We talked about this last week. They're going to be removed at the rapture, and the world will be filled with the spirit of Satan, the spirit of Antichrist. Their hearts are going to overflow with hatred as they follow the Antichrist in his campaign to conquer. The Bible tells us that the streets will overflow with blood from those who refuse the mark of the beast, those who refuse to bow the knee to Antichrist. Now, if this wasn't bad enough, we see the third horseman roll in. Look at verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature, the third angel, say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. And do not harm the oil and the wine. This is the black horse of famine. Famine, unfortunately, is a normal consequence of war. Whenever you have a major war, famine normally follows. Those scales that we see the Bible depicts him carrying, they're measuring small amounts of food, and that speaks of the worldwide devastating famine that's going to occur. It says a, a measure or a quart of wheat for a denarius or three quarts of barley for a denarius. A denarius in those days, that was an entire day's wage. A quart of wheat or three quarts of barley was ration enough for one day's food for one person. So what the Bible is telling us here, it's going to be a time of famine to the point where it's going to take an entire day's wage just to buy food for one person for one day. Now, a lot of people say, but pastor, what is it talking about when it says, but do not harm the oil and the wine? Well, wheat and barley... That represents food for the common everyday person. Amen. Just the common working class everyday person. 
Wine and oil, that's exclusive. That's luxury. That's food set aside for the very wealthy. And what it's telling us here is that this devastating famine is going gonna, is gonna to just absolutely corrupt the, the normal everyday person. But those in power, those under the tutelage of Antichrist, the powerful elite, they're going to be okay. They're still going to live fat on the hog, high on the horse. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Let's look at verse 7. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the, fourth, uh, the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades, or hell, followed with him. And power was given to them over one-fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So this fourth rider on this pale horse of disease and death. Now that word pale literally means like a a greenish yellow. It represents the color, I apologize, it's right before lunch, but mucus, pus, disease. Amen? It represents uh, infection and disease. Now what naturally follows war and famine? Infection and disease. Amen. Now, I also want to note the Bible tells us that this horse has power to take out one quarter, one fourth of the entire earth's population in this one judgment. Anyone know what the population of the world is today? Roughly eight billion. Eight billion people in the world today. In one judgment, this one pale horse, the Bible tells us that two billion people will be wiped out. Two billion people killed. After the bloodshed of war and the diseases of famine will come death. And after death, the Bible tells us, will be followed by hell, by Hades. Death claims the body, but hell claims the soul. Amen? We cannot reject Jesus Christ, our one and only Savior, and not expect consequences to be paid. Amen? I believe these horsemen are quickly approaching our horizon today, ready to charge in at every, any moment. The great day of his wrath is at the door. And this is just a tiny snapshot of the wrath and the judgment that is coming. Amen? Now, as I stated earlier, this is going to be a time of literal hell on earth. The Holy Spirit and the church, the body of all born-again believers, are going to be removed at the rapture. They are the two forces today that are holding back the worst evil and the worst kind of wickedness. You and I, the church, filled with God's Holy Spirit, we are the ones holding back wicked and pure evilness. Once we're removed, guess what's going to happen? Satan's going to unleash his demon spirits. He's going to unleash all of his fallen angels upon the world. Go to Revelation chapter 9. Look at verse 1. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, the abyss. And he opened the abyss, the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So the Bible gives us a picture here of a star falling from heaven to the earth. Now, if you look in the Old Testament through the Psalms, many different passages, stars are also uh, uh, symbolic of what? Angels. Amen? So what God is telling us here that there was an angel that fell from heaven 
to the earth. Anybody have any idea who that angel might be? Lucifer. Amen. So this star that fell from heaven is Satan. And the Bible tells us that he has the key to the abyss, the bottomless pit. Now this pit, this abyss is a jail cell for the most wicked and unclean demon spirits. And the Bible tells us here that Satan will unlock their cages and he's going to turn them loose upon the earth during this time of tribulation. So what, do we, what can we expect? Let's look at verse 3. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth, or any green thing, or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. What we're reading here, again, we need to understand this is symbolic language. Amen? There's going to be so many demons that Satan's going to unlock and unleash from this abyss, the bottomless pit, that is going to look like a swarm of locusts. Anyone ever witness a swarm of locusts? It looks like a massive cloud. You can't even see through it. Their diet, the Bible tells us, will not be the traditional vegetation. Normally, they eat exactly what it says that for them not to eat. Uh, normally, it's grass and trees, the greenery. It's not going to be their normal diet. What's going to be their diet? Unsaved man. That's their target. They're not allowed to kill them, the Bible says, but they are there to torment them. So much so, the Bible says, that they wish they were dead. Which means they're going to try to commit suicide. They're going to try to take their lives, but God is not going to allow them to. And they're going to be tormented, the Bible says, for five months. Let's look at verse 7. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold. And their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair. And their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions and their, uh, they were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months. And they, uh, they had a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So what do we see here? Well, we see this uh, legion of demons, these evil spirits that Satan unleashes upon the earth. And they're described as looking like horses prepared for battle. That's talking about how orderly and how swift and how strong they're going to attack. It says that they have crowns on their heads, symbolic of the authority that Satan has given them. It says they have faces of men. What does that mean? Well, that represents intelligence. Unless they look like Charlie, then we know better. But faces of men, that means they have intelligence. Hair like women. That is symbolic of their seductive allure. But underneath that beautiful hair, what does it say? They have teeth like a lion. Breastplates of iron. That talks about how they are strong and forged for battle. And again, it says they were given power to hurt men for five months. Is that coincidence? Is that just a random number? Anyone know what the life cycle is of a locust? Five months. What that's telling us is that they are going to be able to run their course as, as Satan has let them free. And it says they have a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew 
is a baden, but in the Greek is a polyon. Now, a baden and a polyon, they both mean the same thing. One is simply Hebrew, the other is Greek, and they mean destroyer. The king that they had over them is the angel of the bottomless pit, the destroyer. He is the king of demons. He is the king of the fallen angels. It is Satan himself. And again, I want to keep stressing that this is just a snippet of the judgments that are going to come during the tribulation period. I just wanted to put some clarity out there, as well as stir up our appreciation as we read what the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians, that Jesus is coming to deliver us from this wrath to come. Amen. And we need to praise him for that. Praise him and thank him. Now, that's the wrath. Now, let's consider the weight. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians in chapter 1. Again, we're working our way backwards from verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. So we saw the wrath. Now what is this wait? And to wait for his son from heaven. There's been a lot of debate within the Christian community, within Christian circles, as to whether or not the church, the bride of Christ, whether or not born-again believers will go through the tribulation. You know that question, are you pre-tribulation or are you post-tribulation? Amen? Well, I want you to understand that there is no debate. Amen? The answer is right here in front of us. And the answer is no. The church, the bride of Christ, will not go through the wrath to come. The church will not go through the tribulation to come. What does it tell us here? That Jesus who delivers us from what? The wrath to come. The answer is right there. If you need more proof, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Look at verse 9. For God did not appoint us to what? To wrath. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. If that's not enough, go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 10. These are the letters, the seven letters to the churches that represent the actual church ages. Verse 10, Revelation 3, Jesus said, Because you have kept my commandment to persevere, I will also keep you... From the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Who was Jesus talking to? Look at verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to who? The church. Amen? Jesus is not going to pour out his wrath upon his beloved bride. The very one that he gave his life, he shed his precious blood and died for. His wrath and his judgment is reserved for those who have rejected him, the unsaved. (coughs) We have example after example in God's word. Just as God removed righteous Noah and he placed him in the ark of safety before he sent the flood of judgment. And just as God removed righteous Lot from where? From Sodom and Gomorrah Gomorrah, before he poured out and rained down his judgment upon that uh, wicked and sinful city. God is going to do the same thing for his bride. Jesus is going to come and at the rapture he's going to take us out of the way. Before he pours out his wrath during the tribulation upon those who rejected him him. Amen? That's why the Bible makes it very clear that we are looking forward to Jesus' coming. We are anticipating Jesus' coming. 
If we had to look forward, if we had to go through and endure that wrath, is that something we would look forward to? Absolutely not. Is that something that we would, you know, excitedly anticipate? Not at all. But the Bible makes it very clear that the coming of Christ is something that we should look forward to, that we should anticipate. It's a time of joy, not a time of fear and dread for the born-again believer. Amen? Although we don't know the day, we don't know the exact hour that Jesus is going to come, he has told us to be what? To be ready. Amen? We are to be ready. He has delivered us from the wrath to come, and he can come and gather us up at any moment. That's why we joyfully wait for his return. Amen? So that's the wait. Lastly, let's talk about the work. So what are we supposed to do while we wait? Just sit on our hands on the pews in church, right? Come to church Sunday morning, sit on the pew, and we're covered. That's our obligation. Is that what Jesus really wants? Not at all. You see, that wait is our occupation like a waiter waits upon the, uh, the customer. We are to wait upon one another as an occupation, not take up space. 1 Thessalonians 1, let's go back there again. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and look, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. What should we be doing? We ought to be getting ready for Jesus to come. And the Bible here in these two verses outlines just how we are to get ready. First and foremost, it talks about how they turned from idols unto Christ. Now, I heard many mistakenly say, the preacher, you know, we don't worship idols in America. You know, people think of idols as those carved, you know, wood carvings of, of false gods. And they say, we don't, we don't worship idols in America. Let me tell you something. We sure do. We just call them by a different name, and they look a lot different. Amen? Instead of mammon, the god of greed, we call it ambition. Amen? Instead of Aphrodite, the god of lust, we call it friends with benefits. We absolutely worship idols. An idol is simply anything that you love, anything that you trust, anything that you serve, anything that you fear more than God is an idol. Amen? Something we're all guilty of. From time to time, we, we fear, don't we? We fear someone, something. Let me tell you something, that's an idol. Because we're saying that person, that thing, is bigger than God. Anything that we love, trust, serve, fear more than God is an idol. We cannot have Christ and this world at the same time. Plain and simple. So the first step in getting ready for the rapture is turning away from the world and turning unto Jesus Christ. Amen? Secondly, it says they turn to God from idols to do what? To serve the living and true God. Second step is getting away from the world, turning away from the world and turning unto Christ, and then serving. How do we serve God? By serving each other. Amen? Christ was physically here some 2,000 years ago, but he's not physically here in physical form, in bodily form today. So how do we serve him? By serving each other. Amen? By taking care of those in need. This is the true test of our faith. If we believe the word of God, then we will serve Jesus Christ. Amen? Jesus said, he put it very simply, if you love me, then what? Keep my 
commandments. You can't break it down any more simple. If you believe the message that God has laid upon our hearts, what is it that you're going to do to reach the unsaved? What is it that you're going to do to warn the unsaved of the wrath to come? Do we believe that the, uh, what the Bible says, that there is wrath to come? Do we believe that? If we truly believe it in our heart, then we should have a burden on our heart for those that are outside this church that are unsaved and lost and undone without Jesus Christ. Amen. Question is, what are we going to do about it? And that is what we ought to be doing, amen, as we wait for Christ to come. As we look forward to his coming. As we long in anticipation for his coming. As we anticipate the very one who has delivered us from the wrath, the judgment to come. Even so, come Lord Jesus.